So I guess I got to start with my first question. First of all, I'm super happy to be here, and I'm going to explain to you why I'm super happy to be here. That's not just a, I'm not just saying that. Um, uh, but I need to know first, who has heard of Gretel's mac and cheese? Okay. Love it. The audience of like restaurateurs, that's the best. I'll, I'll take that. That's amazing. Um, for those of you who don't know, we um, started Good Old. Um, so mac and cheese is just a beloved staple. Um, and we've got a crazy market where um, one of our leading competitors is 85 years old and hasn't evolved nutritionally in 85 years. And then there's our next incumbent, the Purple Box, um, which is 35 years old and hasn't evolved nutritionally in 35 years. So myself, Paul, my co-founder, Deb Lester, who's actually the original president of Annie's, um, she's kind of appalled that and she started Annie's and then like they have not evolved at all. Um, so she's on my founding team, um, as is Molly Mache, my amazing food scientist. Um, and then Gal Gadot, Wonder Woman, if you, if you, if you know who Gal is, um, she is part of my founding team as well. And we just said, uh, let's give this a try. And we launched a year ago. We're currently in every Target around the country, every Whole Foods around the country. Um, we are in 1,500 Safeway Albertson stores. We just got word yesterday that we're going into another 1,300 Publix. We're going into, oh, and then we're la also launching um, so our mac and cheese is, the tagline is noodle gutter. So mac and cheese is what we're starting with, but um, we're actually going into dry, we've already kind of gone into dry pasta because the noodle itself is packed with protein, high fiber, 21 nutrients, all from organic veggies, and it cooks up and tastes and is al dente exactly like a normal noodle. Um, so it's kind of magical. And so we're actually heading, this is new news, nobody knows yet, but in March, we're launching um, dry pasta as well. And we just got word that uh, Whole Foods has accepted our full line of pastas. We're going into all Whole Foods, Whole Foods in a couple of months too. So, and all of that has happened since we launched um, basically like 365 days ago. So it's been a whirlwind. We're also selling online um, at goodold.com. That's actually where we started and where we launched the business. Um, I thought I had inventory for five months. We ended up selling out in two weeks. And uh, it's been a crazy, crazy, crazy whirlwind ever since. So that's my food, my food, current food background. I've also led a baby food company. And I've done multiple companies in and around either consumer brands or software companies that help CPG food companies get scale and grow really, really fast. So this is, this is kind of my, my world. And um, I was going to kind of tell you guys, and I have this cute little noodle slide that you can't see, but um, my journey um, started, um, my noodle journey, I guess we'll call it, is I started doing, in college, um, I did my junior year abroad and I took a year off to go live in Paris and I studied at LCA, one of the, um, the University of um, the Sorbonne, which is one of the, the, the colleges there. And in, I've always wanted to learn how to cook. I come from a family that has no good cooks. Like we literally had the mag, the little sign in the kitchen that said, when the smoke alarm goes off, dinner is ready. That's my mom. And I just always wanted to learn how to cook. So I tried to learn, I went and found a restaurant in Paris called Cozy, um, C-O-S-I, and um, told the head chef, I want to learn everything you want to learn. Um, at the time, this was a long time ago, I'm old, um, there was like women in kitchens were not really a thing. And it was like, no, you're, you're good. And so I ended up having to, what I did was I snuck away. I really wanted to go check out the Rangis, the markets, the crazy markets where it's like an entire airplane hanger of cheese, an entire airplane hanger of like vegetables and all this kind of stuff. I snuck in the delivery truck, um, stowed away in there. And once we were at Rangis, I popped out and I was like, I'm not going anywhere. You might as well teach, teach me what you know. So I ended up um, becoming amazing close friends with our head chef, um, learned a lot about restaurants, fell in love with it. Um, I worked on a little project while I was there where the, the boss, Drew Hooray, was, um, he's like, Jen, 
because I was managing front of the house while I was just kind of learning how to cook in the back. And he's like, could you like document all this and like do this little like a manual of operations? Because I'm thinking about franchising this. And I was like, hey, I don't know how to do that. I'm a junior in college, but I'll type it all up. Like how we do what we do. We ended up, he ended up, I got none of this. He ended up selling that franchise manual of operations to two brothers out of Chicago. Um, if there's anyone in New York or Chicago, D.C., if you know the cozy restaurant chains, COSI, that is like on every corner in New York and Chicago and everything. So those two brothers bought my franchise manual of operations and brought it to U.S. It actually was a publicly traded company and was, you know, then went, went bankrupt during during COVID. Um, but that was my that was my little company. So or that was my little restaurant that I put this together, this little manual for. So um, I thought after that experience that I was going to go into restaurant world. Um, I joined the IAWCR, the International Association of Women's Chefs and Restaurateurs. Um, Barbara Tropp, the amazing um, late Barbara Tropp. Um, if you don't have the China Moon Cookbook, get it right now. It's incredible. Um, she was one of my coaches and mentors. And then Margaret Fox um, of Cafe Beaujolais. She also has a series of cookbooks, like how to, like, it's, it's, they're my favorite in the whole world. Um, she had a breakfast restaurant, and that's what I thought I wanted to open was a breakfast restaurant. Um, so I sold, or not sold my house, but I left my apartment, moved to this little tiny town of Mendocino, uh, showed up there and said, Margaret, you've never met me before, but I'm dead and I want to learn and to cook everything you know how to cook in your restaurant because I want to open a breakfast restaurant just like you. And she goes, oh, sweetie, we're not doing breakfast this year. We're just going to do dinner. And I was like, oh, okay, that's all right. And um, was all right because her husband, Chris Comp, was the head chef um, who is, you know, part of an amazing culinary lineage and the Austrian castle and, like, the crazy. It was, it was an amazing team to learn from. Um, and I got to work there as a restaurant. But what I took away from that after working there for a year and a half as a restaurant um, was that I don't want to run a restaurant. Um, it was hard, super hard work, and it was felt very not scalable to me. I think I clearly had, like, an entrepreneurial vein. Like, I like the idea of, like, starting this one and then not being there for the 6 to 20 years afterwards where – for me, it was just not enough newness. Like, we have a new appetizer today, and like, was, that was just not enough for me personally. <laughs> so right after that, I'm like, great. I kind of did all this to become, to open a restaurant, and now I know that I don't want to open a restaurant. So I went to business school and started doing foodie stuff. So I became a brand manager, learning how to, like, you know, run a brand and scale a brand or consumer packaged goods. Um, I did three startups, um, one being baby food, and now this one being um, noodles, gooder. Um, and so I guess I could say that I'm well qualified to talk about this just because I've never run a restaurant. Um, and I, but I've done kind of all the alternate revenue channels that one could. And I'm going to say that franchise is a thing. Um, and obviously consumer packaged goods and um putting a food out there in the world is another thing that I know a ton about. Um, but hats off to all y'all who are doing the restaurant thing. It wasn't for me, but thank you to all of you guys who are doing it. It is such hard, incredibly important work. And, um, but for, for, for me, I kind of did all the other revenue streams other than the restaurant. So that's kind of my, my way of saying, um, I'm, I'm happy to chat about this this topic, and um, yeah, just happy happy to happy to be here. So um, I know that I can't specifically take questions, but I guess I might. I have 27 slides that you can't see, but one of the ones just by way of what we just talked about. I mean, you guys know that whether it's like the old fashioned example of Wolfgang Puck has been doing that for doing licensing of his name really for 18 years. Um, you know, if you guys are building something or creating something that, that the Wolfgang Puck example is 
um, he's they're kind of, he, he and his team are kind of overseeing. He's basically just licensing his name and making it available to throw it on other people's products. And people pitch them all day long. Like, we got a concept. You just throw your name on it and you get a X percent and like we do the rest. So obviously that might sound good because you're not doing anything, but you do, obviously in order to kind of go that route, you've got to have built a brand and a name and, and, and all of those sorts of things. So I'm going to set aside that example because um, I think that if you're that famous and people are pitching you all the time to throw your names on things, that's, that's not quite in the, the, the realm of, of what we're talking about here. Um, I think that more recent examples, um, though, you think you guys are all in New York, so obviously you know David Chang and you know Momo Fugu. Um, you probably know Christina Tosi and the, the, the milk bar, um, the milk bar brand and what she's done with it. Um, I assume everyone knows about it, but obviously the chain of restaurants that David ran, um, his, his store, his shop that he's running right now is actually becoming a much bigger part of his, um, kind of overall revenue profile and brand profile. Um, a few things, and this is true for Christina too. Obviously, Christina came up through the David Chang world, and they're they're kind of helping each other out with all of this. But um, I think that it's fascinating. And one thing that I know, because um, I know both of them, and they're they're awesome and amazing. Um, they they, I think it's the that alternate revenue stream of having their sauces, their noodles, cookies, whatever it is. Um, available direct to consumer is um, a viable option and, and, and a good reminder that it was the revenue stream while during COVID when restaurants were shut down. So if you think about it as kind of diversifying your portfolio and risk and things like that, um, it, it, it makes good sense. But it is a, it's a really different business. And I think that that's probably the biggest um, mind shift that if you guys are thinking about like, do I have a sauce? Do I have a condiment? Do I have a dessert? Do I have a, whatever it is, it's kind of my signature thing that I could um, start to put out into the world. Um, you know, it's not something that you can cook up in your kitchen. If you're doing this, you're probably going to be needing a partner that is a partner um, that is a co-manufacturing partner. And of course, what the flexibility and all the things that you can do in a kitchen, you really can't do at a giant industrial scale. So that's why I guess my tip is like, think simple. Um, you might have an amazing eggplant, moussaka, something, something, something. But by the time you add in the kill step and the, all the different things that you have to have in, in, in you know, more industrial scale manufacturing, is not going to be kind of what you're what you're thinking. So I would I think about like keeping it really really simple, um, and just remembering that it, it's probably a pretty different team um, and a really different skill set that you're going to need. So I guess don't think about it as something you can kind of slap on and ask your existing team to um, figure out. Unless it's uh, you're probably going to need an, an investor and a partner and someone who's going to help you know put some dollars into it and just have a very separate, a very different business plan for, for that part of the business, um, which is totally, totally doable. You've done it before with your restaurants. You can absolutely um, do that, do that again. And I think that um, both are, there's two different ways to put a product out there. Obviously putting it out and having it in the restaurant is makes a ton of sense as a place to begin. Um, and then I think there's either D to C, which most, many restaurants have and are already enabled for commerce anyway. So that's probably an easier route to get started. But honestly, the, the retail route as well, which is going to a, a small chain or a small grocery in your local area, just getting on the shelves and starting to build buzz that way is not a bad way to go either. Um, we do both. And so I'm kind of a do it all kind of person because you never know when what's going to hit and when. Um, and if you've done all the work to build an actual product and put it in jars and get it all signed off and whatever, like why not sell it everywhere kind of a thing. Um, but both of those are both of those are real and totally doable um, opportunities. I wish I could ask questions. Yeah, this would be um, Jen. Do you want to take questions now? Uh, maybe before. 
Sure. Or, or... I, the, the two other points that I just wanted to make, I, it, it really doesn't matter because you can't see my slides. Um, I, I was going to just kind of provoke you guys with a, a couple of examples. Um, another, you know, this, the CPG thing is the main angle, but there's a couple other things um, like like swag and merch and things like that. It's, it's a crazy trend right, right now where you can have your customers pay you to do marketing for you. Um, and and it's, it's a tough thing to like find something that is cool enough that people are willing to spend $68, $84 on a hoodie that's willing to go out and walk around and, and, um, and do that work for you, that marketing work for you. But my examples, um, if anyone knows about Slutty, Slutty Vegan, yeah. you guys know Slutty Vegan out of Atlanta? Okay, awesome. Um, you know, they've got the loyal slut sweats and the worldwide slut sweats and the bloody vegan shirts and eat plants bitch and all of that kind of stuff. They're making, this is a giant revenue stream for them. And another great render, you've probably seen it everywhere, the belly welly, like hot girls have IBS. They're making so much money off the merch. So I think that you can't just like do your logo and throw it on there. I think it's all about like doing something provocative. It has to be authentic to your brand. You can't just like put swear words on a shirt and it's gonna sell. But I think that if you can find something funny, provocative, um, any of those sorts of things where you can tap into a meme or to a trend, I just, I, it's amazing. I can't share the actual numbers of how much they're making in merch, but it is significant. So don't, for, don't, don't underestimate it. Great, thank you. Um, we know we started late because of the technical issues, so I just want to be aware of you know we have other more time. Yeah, so, yeah, um, totally. No, no. So um, I don't know if this maybe like one question or two, and at the end if we have more time, we can do that. Yeah. Um, okay. Quick question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. What marketing did you do to launch online? And how did it contribute to you selling out in two weeks? Mm, it's so unfair. I'm, it's, my answer is so annoying. We did we did a ton. We did um, so we obviously press and PR. Um, I'm going to list out all the stuff. But we have Wonder Woman. She's got a hundred million followers. Um, she was launching the Red Notice movie and she was on the red carpet and people are asking about the movie and she's like, can we talk about mac and cheese? So she was on James Corden. It's totally unfair to compare yourself to, 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 to us. But, you know, that's a very temporary buff. So obviously selling out in two weeks, like, gall helps. Um, so if you have a gall in your life, uh, have her help. Um, but the truth is, like, that's a, that's a very one-time bump. Like, like, it definitely contributed to awareness. But then on day three, the long slog of just blocking and tackling and growing this brand by skin of your teeth and scrapping begins. And that's what we've been in ever since, uh, ever since that day. So um, we were very intentional. We wanted earned media to be a biggest, the biggest part, not paid. Um, because if I have to pay money every time someone wants to buy it, it's just it's like we're going to run out of money. We can't compete against Kraft. We can't compete against Annie. We'll never outspend them. So we made the decision to kind of outweird them and to do things that they would never do because that's kind of the only game that we can win at that they can't follow. So whether it's launching like our little mac and cheese stuffies or skateboards that shoot mac and cheese down the, the table. Um, I don't know. We've got funny, we've got knuckle tacks, we say like do-gooders. We've got, um, like, we just did, we just went crazy with like merch and funny things and weird things. And we just keep doing, the weirder we get, the more successful we are because I think that it's such a breath of fresh air in a landscape that everyone kind of just does the same thing. We just went out and said, what would Crab never do? And what would Annie never do? Um, and the more we do of that, the more successful we are. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's my alter ego, Irene from May May. <laughs> um, so as we're pulling up the slides, um, 
I will say, I think the most important thing is that our company, Meme Dumplings, is still really new. Um, it's still a baby company, even though we have this long, complicated history. Oh no, the format. That's okay. It will all be fine in the PDF, I promise. Yes, it will. Um, so this is uh, our long and storied history. Um, we opened as a food truck in 2012, and then went through lots of iterations, um, including we opened a shipping container, we started doing catering, uh, we wrote a cookbook, and we have another one coming out this year. And I do want to point out that in 2015, we launched our first CPG sauce product. Um, and we folded it the same year because we learned what Jen was just saying, which is it is a completely different business. No matter how many customers come up to you and say, that sauce is so good, you should put it in a bottle. Like, OK, that sounds great, right? Um, but nobody wanted to do it, and nobody wanted to be kind of the point person on it. And so it was not the right move for our company at that time. Um, in COVID, we pivoted. You know how if you pivot enough times, you're actually just like spinning in a circle and making yourself <laughs> sick? That's what we did. Um, so going back to Anne's presentation before, we did cocktails, meal kits, family style, contract meals, grocery for paying customers, grocery for the food insecure, groceries for our own team. We launched a nonprofit, and we did mutual aid, and we used no tech platforms or third parties. And we also decided that we were going to make prepared dumplings at far for farmers markets and then open our own dumpling factory and cafe. It's really easy, um, I think Jen said this yesterday, to make this look like a straight line, but it's not. We were spinning all over the place. Um, and then 2025 is what we've targeted for national expansion, and I'll talk a little bit about what is so complicated about that. So um, our customers love our sort of our brand personality, our creative Chinese American flavors, and um, the way that we source our ingredients. And so we had a, a customer come to us and say, hey, you guys should really bring your product to the farmer's market. Um, you know, farmer's markets are still open during COVID, and those are your people there. You know, the people who want to eat farm to table Chinese food, they're at the markets. And I remember I said, that's such a nice invitation, but like, aren't farmer's markets like, they're kind of for startups? And it was like, newsflash, it's COVID. Everyone's a startup again, right? right? So we decided to give it a shot. And the very first day we went to a farmer's market, we had to send the van back to the restaurant twice to reload. And we are still struggling to keep up with demand. Even just this past week, we had to send a, a restock van to all of our locations. So we like to say at Mei Mei that dumplings make the world go round because every culture has a dumpling of some kind, you know, a delicious thing wrapped in stuff. Um, and so we uh, feel like that is, you know, what we wanted to kind of double down on and make the future of our company. Um, we also kind of have all this co-branded stuff, um, including uh, online and in-person cooking classes, especially dumpling classes. Um, in 2021, dumpling classes online were almost half of our revenue. Um, and so that will continue to be part of the factory and cafe. Um, and then, of course, books, and then trying to hustle as much press as we possibly could, um, which is also something I'm happy to talk about with anyone who's interested. Um, I do want to add also, yesterday when Ida was talking and asked, um, who in here bootstrapped? I raised my hand. And then when Ida said, who in here raised more than a million dollars? I raised my hand again. And I was like, OK, that's kind of cheating. But the first version of the business, we bootstrapped um, for less than 85K, I think. And in order to open this factory, um, we have raised just over $2 million. Um, most of that is through the SBA and other kinds of loans. Um, and then a quick note, for there's a lot of interest in the VC world yesterday. Um, I have raised some VC funding um, for PrepShift, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about that. Um, the VC world is a weird place. Um, it's basically like Squid Game, like you know the, um, <laughs> the TV show. It's like rich people hire slightly less rich people to do their bidding, and then only one out of every 400 people actually wins. Um, so <laughs> happy to give you my unvarnished opinion, um, <laughs> perhaps uh, somewhat unlike the other speakers on that topic. Um, but basically, this is all to say that like we are kind of a lifestyle brand, in a sense, and we have all these products that sort of wrap around the main product, which is the dumplings. 
So my team right now is working on um, soft opening our 5,000 square foot factory and cafe. You can see um, there's a window that looks onto the cafe, or sorry, onto the factory floor. And then we have a dining room in front that we're going to use for serving guests, of course, and also for classes. Um, private corporate classes are where it's at. Um, and we also have a beer and wine license, so that's huge for us. The facility in the back um, is also going to be inspected by the state of Massachusetts so that we can wholesale, and it is going to be inspected by the USDA so that we can wholesale a meat product. Um, these are two kind of peculiarities when it comes to CPG, um, that different levels of distribution and different inclusions of ingredients will change the permitting requirements. So when you have a meat product that you want to wholesale, you actually have to have a USDA inspector on site every day that you produce. And they need their own office, or at least like a little filing cabinet. Um, and so as you can imagine, that is an expensive project. I will say we budgeted uh, 1.4 million for the build out, and it came out to 2.3. Um, so that hurts. Um, but we were able to raise um, a bunch of money through different means. And we also got an amazing um, tenant improvement allowance from our landlord, who really, really wanted us there. Because oops, they had only put white men and their businesses in the building so far. Um, so we are really excited about this. And um, hopefully, when you all come to Boston, you can come visit. And um, again, like I said, like this company's a baby. Um, we still don't know what wholesale looks like. We don't know what national expansion looks like. Um, we are hoping to be in grocery. Um, we are hoping to one day be in Whole Foods. I'm going to call Jen about that. Um, but for the moment, you know, we have been direct to consumer, and we have really good data from that. So like we go to the Winchester Farmers Market outside Boston. We have all of our sales numbers. And then we can go to the local grocery store there and say, hey, look what we did. Don't you want a piece of that? Um, so that's been our strategy so far, um, as well as uh, selling bulk dumplings to other food service um, operators. So like TD Garden um, and Fenway Park have both reached out to us to have dumplings at the ball games, which like sounds pretty great. Um, and then, of course, being a co-packer for other businesses. Um, we decided not to go to a co-packer who would make our dumplings. We like control, and so we are doing it ourselves. But it also means we, uh, we bought a machine, and we can use that machine to make stuffed foods for um, other businesses. And so that is a long-term goal for us. And it's one of the things that really keeps us going, is knowing that um, we will be able to support other entrepreneurs and pay it forward. Yeah, do you have a question? So do you ship like, uh, nationally? We do ship nationally. It is so expensive that we don't really recommend it. Um, and that's a huge bummer. But for people who are willing um, to pay an exorbitant price, um, we do ship. But we recommend taking a dumpling class virtually, um, because that's way cheaper. And uh, you can put whatever you want in the dumpling. So yeah. Um, for our corporate clients, we also ship kits of materials. Um, so they get everything in one box. It has all the instructions. It's ready to go. And then they just log on to Zoom whenever they're ready. Um, wanted to talk really quickly about the economics. Um, I put the uh, revenue, the price, all of the expenses, the percent of revenue, and then I compared it to what we were doing in the restaurant. You already saw some of the restaurant's numbers. Maybe you looked at the Eater article and you saw our p and um, But basically, um, in theory, if we are selling this retail at a farmer's market, the gross profit is sick. It's really good compared to operating a restaurant. So you can imagine that that was very appealing for us. Um, in addition to overhead expenses, you also want to consider farmer's market labor. Um, if you have five farmer's markets on Saturday, you need at least seven people on shift um, to make sure that you can go to all of those places. Um, transportation, like the overheads are just different. Um, they're not as bad as running a restaurant, though. And then this is our estimate um, for wholesale unit economics. And as you can see, um, the gross profit in terms of percent of revenue is actually a little bit worse. Again, this is not accounting for overhead expenses. Um, and so obviously, with wholesale, the goal is to do volume. Um, I don't know. A lot of people are like, you can make up for it in volume. I don't know that that's entirely true. But um, certainly, volume helps. Um, and you can afford more if you're doing serious volume. Um, another thing that 
we want to consider is um, the retailer and distributor margins. So if we're selling our dumplings to um, a local specialty food store, they might be more willing um, to eat a higher wholesale cost because they want our brand in the shop. Um, but if we go to Market Basket, we'll never be in Market Basket, I'm pretty sure. Um, but <laughs> that's a local um, grocery chain in Boston. Um, they are going to say, we need to make more money on every box of dumplings we sell. And then if we're selling to Market Basket through a distributor, they need their margin too. And so really quickly, that 50% gross profit turns into much, much less than 33%. Um, in some cases, you also have to pay to get your product on shelves. You may have to do sampling. You'll have to create special collateral like marketing for going into grocery stores. So all of that uh, is not free or cheap. Um, and then the cost of scaling. I think um, Jen said it well that like you might have a great recipe that you make at home. And then when you take it to direct to consumer, to the farmer's market, you're going to have to level up. You're going to need some new equipment. You're going to need to be in a real kitchen probably. And then when you go to wholesale, you have to level up again. What got you here is not going to get you there. And so that's why we spent $50,000 on a machine from Taiwan that produces, I want to say, it's 8,000 dumplings an hour, um, which is crazy. Our team can't keep up with that, so we don't actually know. Um, it's a good claim that they've made, and we can't test it. Um, but so um, you know, just because you have the product ready to go doesn't mean that you have all of the infrastructure ready to support that kind of scale. Um, and all of our build out, all of the equipment that we bought, oh my god, you guys. We bought a full-size combi that you can roll a whole rack into, and like we are obsessed with it. Um, so that's a huge game changer, right? And it's necessary for the volume that we want to do. And it was also like I don't know, twenty thousand um, dollars. I do want to talk about our team because, um, as you can tell, I'm here and I also have another job. Uh, and so all of this is occurring more or less without me. Um, these are my two co-founders, Alyssa and Annie. They are both MBAs. They are both smarter and more efficient than I am. Um, and then we have uh, a number of managers, um, our production side, and then our um, marketing uh, and kind of sales side. And we have kitchen operations staff of like another five people. Um, and we would love to have more staff, and we're hiring right now. Um, and so all of this is just to say, number one, it takes a lot of people to make a pivot like this. Um, I think there are a lot of kind of solopreneurs who have a product that they want to take to market. Um, it is really, really hard to do by yourself, because it's hard to do with this many people, too. Um, and then the other thing I want to say, um, I worked with Alyssa at Maymay. Um, she was an employee for about five years prior to um, my bringing her on as a partner. Annie was um, a, a friend of hers from business school and kind of helped out behind the scenes. Um, and now we are all roughly equal partners in Maymay. Everybody told me that that was a bad idea. They said, you know, maybe you'll give them 2%, or like maybe you'll be really generous and give them 5%. And I don't know if I made a mistake, but I know that they don't call me when the sewage is backing up because they really feel like they own the company. Right. Um, and so I feel pretty good about that decision so far. Next year, we can talk again, um, and I can tell you if I was wrong. But um, you know, I think that uh, like a high growth tech company, you might be happy with a quarter of a percent. Um, but this is not a cash cow in that way. This is something that I want us to build together. And I want them to know that they own it. Uh, and owning 5% of something, that's not, that's not really owning it. Um, and you know, we don't expect, I think, um, to one day exit this company um, for many millions of dollars, per se. And so that's why um, they both have in the high, mid to high 20s um, of percent of the company. Um, and they didn't put in any capital, um, but they're putting in <laughs> their blood, sweat, and tears right now. Um, so yeah, I, I, I didn't listen to anyone's advice, and I usually don't. Um, yeah, do you have a question? Are they receiving salaries as well? Yes, they are receiving salaries. Um, I think right now they both make 60 k um, and I pay myself like a pretty small stipend, like 100 bucks a week or something like that. Um, when I teach classes, I, I pay myself out for that. Um, and our, I'll just say a couple other financial things in case people are curious. Um, wages for our team start at $15 an hour. 
We have a pretty good benefits package. Um, and like going to farmers markets is really fun, and they all get a dumpling budget that they can give away to people. They can trade with other vendors. Um, but the truth is, most of our employees are not relying on us for all of their income. Um, and that is, to a certain extent, by design. Um, living wage in Boston is like $22.61. We are nowhere near that. Um, and so we have a long way to go, but we are hoping that we can get there as we kind of get this show on the road. Um, and this is where it all started, little food truck. Um, we recently, well, a couple years ago, we said goodbye to the food truck. Um, it's probably living its life as someone else's food truck now, which would be exciting to know about. Um, and we just exited our original location on Park Drive um, in Boston. And so now we are in Southie, uh, and we would love to see you there. Thank you all so much. Thank you. That was so good. Um, hi, guys. It's me again. Nice to see everybody. Thank you all for um, so many kind words. It's very cool. So thank you. I really appreciate it. You all are awesome. Um, I'm going to talk today about UNFEM and how we grew and everything that we've learned so far along the way. Um, I hope you all had a chance to drink some last night. So huge thanks. Do you have a question already? Um, no, I just wanted to know that the rosé was so good. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, so I, uh, the presentation I put together today is actually based on what our fundraising deck was for our Series A. So a lot of what I'll go through is, um, I think, what led us to be able to do the fundraising. So you'll get to see a lot of transparency today as well. So this is a glamour shot of me. And um, so this is just truly our backstory, which I touched on yesterday, but I'll talk about a little bit more specifically. So as I mentioned, at the Riddler, um, in San Francisco and New York, we found consistently that so many of our guests were asking for women-made champagne and sparkling wines. And um, I launched the brand truly as our house wine, um, just so that we could answer that question successfully. Um, and also because I found a sparkling wine producer in Champagne, a true champagne producer whose wines we loved, who is a fifth generation producer, and who we wanted to team up with on a project. She was a big fan of the Riddler, and so it was just very, very organic. We never thought that this product would take off, and in fact, um, if you all know anything about the Tide House laws, um, the way that alcohol is legislated is that we have a three-tier system in the US because of post-prohibition. Everyone's nodding their heads, but I'll just touch some of the specific details in case you're thinking about launching an alcohol brand, and you also own restaurants. So each uh, state has different laws, um, but they're heavily restrictive no matter where you are. Um, and you cannot cons um, own at the same time a restaurant license and or a distributor license and or a brand. Um, you can have a brand and sell it just at your own shops in some states, your own restaurants, your own retail stores, but you can't sell it to lots of other places. Um, so if we still had the Riddlers open, we would not be able to be growing in the way that we are. Um, or we could do it, it just would not be compliant, and at some point we would get caught, and then we would lose our licenses for the restaurants, and we would probably be sued and would lose a lot of money. So although it totally sucks that the Riddler is closed, um, out of all of that has grown this really big business that now is our full-time focus. But when we originally launched the brand, it was truly a side hustle. It was just a product that we had on the list that was our Wines by the Glass, and then um, after that, we realized that there was an actual business. And you'll see over a three year period so far, we've grown a lot. Um, and there's still like a huge amount of growth left available because the wine market is massive. Um, so just two years in, um, we've become what we think is the fastest growing sparkling wine brand in the country. So going back to first, best, or only, um, you know, thinking about being the only dumpling factory in all of the United States where you can see the dumplings being made and then also you can eat them. Um, so we, this is a claim that I, I think is true. We don't know exactly what it means, but we're very fast growing. Um, we've 1400 x our growth this year and we anticipate that we'll at least double our growth next year. So this was like the huge, huge year of growth. Um, we sold 2.3 million cans. Uh, most of that's coming from our partnership with Delta, but also we're in a lot of amazing individual 
restaurants, retail shops, distributed all across the country, um, and a lot of other great partners that we'll talk about. So this, if you are fundraising, is a good slide to include. Um, so this shows that um, you know very clearly what we've accomplished in two years and a trajectory of growth. If you're raising specifically from VC or private equity, they're definitely going to want to see growth. So that's something that we talk a lot about here in the deck. So this is our, um, these are our flagship wines. So the Juliet, um, Mary, where's Mary? Mary's there. Mary served our Juliet um, for New Year's Eve at her wine shop, wine, or her wine bar slash restaurant um, in Boston, which is so cool. I didn't even know it, but we talked about it yesterday. Um, and you may have had it at some cool restaurants here in New York. Um, this is our premium tier wine. Um, this we make in partnership with a female winemaker um, who's a fifth generation winemaker. It's organic. Um, it is all hand harvested. It is like really, really top of the line in terms of champagne. Um, it typically retails somewhere between $55 and $65 a bottle. So you might see it on a wine list between $120 and $180 a bottle, something like that. So premium price point. Um, this was the wine that we launched first. Um, and this is just truly a wine that we loved. It was essentially white labeled for us by this producer. And then we put our label on it and our brand. Um, but we bought the product from them and then we marked it up. Um, we would love to have this wine available on the market right now, but champagne is heavily, heavily allocated, so we could only get something like 500 cases. Um, we'll be doing more wines with this producer and more champagnes in the future, but this is like the very terroir-focused wine that is appropriate for all the cool restaurants that you all run, that we all go to, that we love that are you know, really premium. Um, but we do have some other wines that are a little bit more focused on accounts that are really oriented towards scale. So the two wines you had yesterday are two California sparkling. So um, the Betty for Betty White um, is our sparkling white wine from California. Um, and the Cali is our sparkling rosé. Um, and that wine we launched with one of our favorite California winemakers, Samantha Sheehan, because at the Riddler, we found that the top selling SKU always was whatever was the most affordable, approachable sparkling rosé by the glass. And I could not find a sparkling rosé by the glass that was dry, that was high quality, that was organic or sustainable, and that was like at our price point and was reliably available. So I reached out to Sam and said, hey, can we make a rosé? So that was our first California wine we made. Um, and that wine has really, really taken off. So, um, both of those two wines are certified sustainable. Um, we use only champagne method, or we only use um, champagne varietals, so um, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir predominantly. Um, and we do that just to keep the brand cohesive. Um, it is, there are very few competitors in the California sparkling wine space, and so we definitely want to own as much of that category as we possibly can. Um, and then, the wine that really took off for us was the mini of the California Rosé. So um, the way that we got our Delta partnership is that my, this is like manufactured luck um, and 20 years of working our asses off in the industry. So my husband has a couple Greek restaurants in San Francisco that I mentioned yesterday, and they were selected to be the food purveyor on Delta in the first class cabins um, from San Francisco on the long haul flights. And I was really involved in like, whining and dining, the Delta team. And at one of those days, um, my husband Charles was like, why don't you show them your wines? And I was like, oh, why don't I? <laughs> and so we showed them the wines. It just so happened that in the month of October, they always fit, feature pink products because they have a relationship with the Breast Cancer Research Fund. And they said, oh, why don't we do these in October? And this was like three months before, something like that. And I was like, sure, why don't we? And then they placed the PO for 5,000 cases, and we had only sold 1,600 cases previously. So we had to figure out how to very quickly make 5,000 cases of sparkling rosé in these bottles. As you can imagine, it was a huge hustle to get all of the supply chain together, to get um, our base wine together, and to be able to do it. But we executed on it successfully, and it, um, but it did not come without challenges. So one thing, they had never run 187s like this in the air. And we found out on day three that the caps were rusting. So they had to remove, I've never talked about this publicly, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, so they had to remove them all from the planes. And we had to do all this testing. And it turns out that because they were like submerging them in ice at altitude, 
it was like not something that the can the the cap manufacturers had ever seen because like no one had tested these in an airplane <laughs> at scale. <laughs> um, and as a point of reference, five thousand cases is what like a lot of really, really great small producers make in a year. So we were doing this in one month, like boom, boom, boom. So we, like this could have been, it was a massive scare for us. We were like, oh my God, we're gonna lose this contract. Um, and so we went, we flew to Delta, like without them asking us to, we just like flew there the next day and we're like, hey, what can we do to make this better? How can we make this right? And they ended up being very receptive of that kind of proactiveness. And so then we ended up working with them to develop a can. So they wanted to do canned sparkling wines to move all of their wines to cans because they're fully recyclable and they're much lighter. So they're much, much lower load um, and they're much more sustainable. So we never wanted to make a wine in cans. I was like so anti-canned wines. <laughs> but then Delta was like, what if you make us 100,000 cases for the year? And I was like, let's make some cans. <laughs> so, so we, uh, we started, we launched our canned Betty. And the Betty has really to totally changed our lives, our company, um, like major, major, major game changer. And has also really changed the way that I think about the business and about just being flexible. So we do a sparkling Pinot Gris in can. It's different from the wine you had last night, but it's still really delicious. It's great for, it's perfect for plain. It's great for mimosas. It's like good margins-ish for a plain. A lot of times on wine on planes has, you lose money on them, but somehow we figured out how to make it work. And the level of exposure that we've gotten has just been truly incredible. So, um, and it's also certified sustainable. That was extremely important for Delta. Um, and the fact that we are woman co-owned was like an absolute, um, not only foot in the door, but really made the decision for them. And so now they've become incredible marketing partners of ours. So they just brought us to CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, where the CEO of Delta included us in his presentation, at his keynote. Like They do amazing stuff with us. And they include us. Now we are a global partner to them. So now we're on all planes in the world, which is crazy. <laughs> so it's awesome. So if you're flying Delta, feel free to order some and send me the bill. And <laughs> hopefully it'll be free. Um, and <laughs> but so it's been amazing. One of the things that's really cool is that our marketing team put a QR code on the back of the, the cans. And that's one of the biggest ways that we get traffic into the website. Um, and I heard somebody yesterday, I was at Chief. I don't know if any of you are members of Chief. It's a women's at the C-suite level um, like membership club. It's really cool. We're at all of the chiefs across the country. And a woman was at the bar and she's like, oh, I, yesterday I was on a Delta plane and this lady was like, have you seen this can? It's made by women. And so it's just, it's an incredible exposure opportunity for us in terms of the product. So just to explain, so the Juliet's organic, the Betty and the Cali are certified sustainable and the cans are certified sustainable as well. Um, I would say the wines that are in the bottles are extremely high quality wines. Like we, we love these wines. I would feel very proud to serve them at the Riddler. And I think the wines in cans are like awesome for canned wines. So this is our up and to the right. So this is, this is, this is why we were able to close the fundraise that we were. Um, the, the market conditions right now are really, really tough for anybody who's raising. Um, I would really encourage anybody who's wanting to do any fundraising in VC or private equity, as I said yesterday, to listen to the All In podcast. It will help you to fundraise. It will really teach you everything you need to know about how VCs think. Um, but this, this is what a VC is looking for, is like really atmospheric growth. And this only happened because of Delta. But something that we talk about as a team is we can't build a business that is only servicing one customer. We have to build an incredible business at amazing independent restaurants, amazing independent shops, um, really great uh, retailers that are chains, that are high quality, that fit with our brand, et cetera. So I think that we'll probably like double next year, but we're not going to see another 1,400 uh, <laughs> X growth. No, I don't, I don't, that's too much. <laughs> we, I don't think we'll be able to keep up. Um, so the ways that we 
have really thought about the business. This is really all my brother. So my brother is my co-founder. He's a Wharton guy, and he has started and sold a couple companies. So I can't emphasize enough how helpful it is to have a co-founder who has very complementary skill set. So if you're the creative, like find somebody who's the finance whiz. Or if you're the finance whiz, find the creative. Um, but for us, we kind of think about three areas that we focus on. So number one is really being the right product at the right price. So we're in the fastest growing category, which is sparkling wine. Um, when you look at all of the data of Nielsen and all of these kinds of things, sparkling wine continues to grow every single month, which is really cool because all of us are out there drinking a lot of sparkling wine. Um, our price point is also the fastest accelerating price point. So premium wines are up. People are drinking fewer bottles, but higher quality. Um, so it's $24.99. And then single serve and RTD. Uh, RTD being ready to drink is also up. So we're in three categories where the TAM, the total addressable market, is expanding. So that's something that's very attractive to VCs as well. The first thing they're going to look at is what's your total addressable market and is it big enough? Like mac and cheese, huge market. Very few competitors, interesting. Huge hockey stick growth. Like if she hasn't done a lot of fundraising already, that will be easy for her plus Gal Gadot can go to her pitch. <laughs> um, a second thing that matters to us a lot is low capex, so it's capital expense. So we do not own vineyards. We do not own a production facility. We do not own an office. Um, we have a distributed team that's all across the US. And then we partner with wineries um, and utilize. We're almost, we're not even like renting their space or borrowing their team. It's like we are. Um, we're almost kind of white labeling with them. It's a, it's, I'm not going to say that it's like a white label, but it's, it's somewhere in that range. So it gives us a lot of freedom and flexibility. And so if Delta comes along and says, we need 100,000 cases, we don't have to build a facility. We find facilities that can manage it. So we work with a huge canning facility, for example, um, called Free Flow that can handle that. We just heard two weeks ago, Free Flow is going out of business. So all of our 100,000 cans, 100,000 cases of cans, we had to scramble really quickly to figure it out. So now we're going to work with Coppola. But um, that's like the positive and the negative of owning your own thing versus the risk of relying on other partners. But we're still sticking with that model for right now. And then a third piece that is massive, and all of you should be doing this no matter what you're doing is we really, really tap into diversity and inclusion budgets for all of our partners. Um, and for Delta, that means that they actually have higher budgets as to what they can spend on a particular purveyor if they check the DE&I box. And it's literally like a form where we check a box. <laughs> and we have to prove a whole bunch of things about our business, but they get massive tax write-offs because they're working with a more diverse set of suppliers, and their audience and their customers love it. OK, so people talk a lot about what is your go-to-market strategy. So when we launched this brand, we did not write a business plan. We uh, did not have a deck. We just like launched the product as part of our products that we had at the restaurant. But now we think a lot about going to market. Anytime we launch a new a SKU, we call them wines, but also SKUs. Um, and the things that we care about are um, now we have national distribution. So we partner with RNDC as our primary distributor. We started with a small independent distributor. We loved them. They were a super amazing, very, very fine wine oriented distributor called Martins. Um, they only worked with highly allocated champagne and um, Burgundy. They were a perfect fit for us when we had just the champagne. And they were like one of our favorite distributors at the restaurant. But they cannot service Delta. They cannot service Target. They can't service Marriott, et cetera. Um, so once we got some of these bigger deals, we had a great conversation with their team saying, like, hey, we want to go to Target. And they're like, cool, you should talk to someone else. <laughs> and uh, we kind of all agreed that it just wasn't the right fit for us to work together. So we switched to RNDC. We talked to both RNDC and Southern. And we really played them off of each other. And we like negotiated both of those. But if we did not come to them with Delta, there's no way they would have picked us up. Um, so like leveraging those big moments, I think, is really important as you're like finding the right partners. And I also think you end up with the right partners at whatever stage of business you're in. So national distribution, we care about D2C and omnichannel. 
Um, D2C is extremely complicated for alcohol. It is less than 1% of our business, but it has been taking a huge amount of our time. So this year, we're refocusing our team not to try to think about it too much. Um, but it's still hard, because people want to ask where they can buy the wines online all the time. Um, we love being in top hotels and restaurants and women's clubs. We especially have a big focus on female psalms, female owners, female chefs. Um, that's like a huge thing. We have an internal program we're launching called the X Factor, which all of you would qualify for, which is like putting together a squad of amazing female restaurant owners who will do really cool programming with. Um, and that's going to be something we're rolling out in the new year. Um, so we can all talk about that after. And then if you want to be an X Factor gal, I know who you can talk to. Um, OK, great. You're all in. Um, and then um, we care very much about like best in category. So we want to be with the best in category independent restaurants. We want to be in the best in category hotels, the best in category retailers, et cetera. As I was saying the other day, like or yesterday, um, you're judged by the company you keep. And I think we all feel that way of when we see certain products at really cool places, we associate good things with them. So here. Um, are on the right-hand side some examples of some of our independent places. So amazing places like Blackberry Farm and Danielle here in New York and Single Thread. Those are all Michelin two and three-star restaurants. Spoke in Boston. Way to go, Mary. Thank you. Um, we're at a bunch of really cool clubs, like the Harvard Club and Chief and Neuhaus. And then we're at great um, larger retailers, like um, we're on Wine.com and Whole Foods, but then we're also at places like Verve, which is an amazing retailer here in New York. They also have one in Chicago and one in San Francisco. Um, so one thing that we talk a lot about as a team is thinking big and partnering with the biggest. So when we think about going into a new category, who we proactively reach out to are like the biggest people we can think of. Like last night, I was having drinks with somebody at Chief who was formerly the COO of Casper and SoulCycle, and she was like, she was like, you're not even thinking big enough yet. I was like, what? How do I think bigger than this? But she was like, what about Sephora? What about Casper? What about SoulCycle? I was like, how do we do a partnership with them? She was like, figure it out. You can do it. So, um, so yeah, so our, our biggest partners, because we've proven that we can execute with Delta, it means that all of these big partners really want to work with us. So Marriott, we're um, mandated by the glass at every Ritz Carlton in the US. Um, Caesars were at 57 of the property, or 57 retail shops um, in in and around Las Vegas. So for any of you in Vegas, let me know, and I'll give you a little little uh, gift card to go into Caesars. Um, and then Target, we're launching in March. Target was my top, top, top goal as a brand. I am a huge Target fan as a woman who grew up in Florida, and <laughs> I love Target because. Um, I think the Target represents such a cool combination of like high-low, of design, of fun, and it's so not snobby. And they actually have a really surprisingly good wine section, and they go really, really deep with our partners. So like Chip and Joanna, and you know uh, all of the cool brands, uh, all of the cool brand partnerships that they've done across luxury fashion, they're starting to do in lifestyle, wine, and beyond. And so our big, big goal is to launch a lifestyle partnership with them that would be kind of the swaggy stuff that, that some of the other speakers have spoken about. So things like champagne coupes, buckets, um, trays, cocktail napkins, et cetera. Um, and then we are also working with, we're working on a partnership right now with Neiman Marcus for the bridal suites. Um, and then uh, the National Soccer League just reached out yesterday, Women's Soccer League reached out yesterday. Um, so we're trying to think like a little differently about these partnerships of not just um, independent restaurant, independent retailer, et cetera. So one thing, if, you are if you're doing a deck for VC, the most important question to answer, actually, the first important question you have to answer is what's the problem that you're solving? How big is, uh, how big is the problem? How huge is your TAM? And, um, what is your solution? And then really what you have to answer is, why now and why you? So the first thing you want to show is how huge your TAM is. So the alcohol business, is, or specifically the sparkling wine business, is a $43 billion category. So that's exciting to them. Um, and it's always good to back it up with Nielsen data and some press. So Nielsen tells us that the sparkling wine category was the fastest to grow with American drinkers over the past two years an upward momentum that shows no sign of abating soon, especially with the threat of champagne shortages and price hikes. 
So you want to be able to show that like you're solving this problem of champagne not being available, and people are really hungry for this category, and there's not enough available. And then you also want to show that you're in the right price point. So our price point of $24.99 is the fastest growing category, whereas everything else is slowing down. Um, I don't know if you guys have felt this too, but I don't, I don't know that I'm spending more on wine, but apparently everybody else is. So. Younger people are not <laughs> drinking, and they're the ones who are drinking cheaper. That's right. That's right. There's a lot happening in non-alc. We've actually explored a lot about should we launch a non-alc. I know so many friends who are women who want a non-alc. Um, but the more and more we've dug into the category, it's like, even though that is the fastest growing category, it's still not a very big category. So we're, I think it'd be cool to do a non-alc sparkling. There's only one good one on the market, but we'll see. Yeah, we could do a trial. But like to do a trial takes a lot of work. I, I'm always the one on the team who's like, let's just try it. And then the ops team is like, let's just not. <laughs> um, this is the slide that I included in the fundraising deck, which I find fascinating. I was like updating all the slides last night. And I was like, that was our team when we raised. So now we're a team of 16. Um, but we, when we raised, it was me and my brother and our CMO. Um, and now we have a chief sales officer. And then we have a sales team, an ops team, a logistics team and then a compliance person full time, um, and an EA slash HR wonderkind who does everything. Um, so one thing that I will say is as you're thinking about building your team, um, I would recommend hiring fewer people, but making them awesome. Yeah. Like so much better to hire two really, really experienced, scrappy, hardworking, people than like five who are kind of all over the place. So our CMO was the first person who we brought on. So she was at Anheuser-Busch for 18 years leading innovation, and which means innovation at these big companies means like launching new products. Um, and then our chief sales officer was at Moat Hennessy for 10 years leading Vuv Clicquot. So for us, we cared a lot about category. Interestingly, the woman from SoulCycle last night who I met said, she was like, why don't you have anybody from any like cool modern brands outside of your category on the exec team? And I thought that was really interesting that I hadn't considered. She was like, I think you're thinking too small about your category. You, everybody on your team is like so alcohol focused. You should try to add somebody at a very senior level who's built consumer brands outside of your category. Um, and then all of our winemakers are women. So our lead winemaker is Samantha Sheehan. Um, we're bringing a winemaker in-house um, who we love, who used to work with us at the Riddler. Um, and Julie Medvi is our champagne producer. We also launched a very, very small project with um, Jennifer and Sarah Morgenstern from Raft and Ruth Lewandowski and their new brand together called Little Trouble. Um, and we love them. They're all amazing. So for us, as we think about innovation, launching new products, it's always about finding amazing women whose wines we already love and that sort of fit within our house style. And then each of our wines has a charitable partner that benefits women. Our two lead charities are um, the Breast Cancer Research Fund, of course, because of our Delta relationship. And then um, Dress for Success is our other lead. Um, they are an amazing organization that works with women across, truly across the globe um, for financial training and getting them back on their feet after they've been out of the workforce. Um, we also plant trees through Tree Sisters, which is both planting trees and helping women to get jobs in very poor countries. And then Batonage, if you're at all interested in women and wine, Batonage is a great organization. Mary's shaking her head, not in her head. Oh, you remember? Oh, amazing. Um, actually, the way that we got into Target was that um, we launched a, these cans of piquettes in partnership with Batonage. And the Target buyer is a member of Batonage, received an email from Batonage saying, that our partnership was there. And she that's like the first thing she heard about us. So I can't stress how incredibly foundational this is to us as a business and core to our DNA, but also what an amazing tool it is for us for building broad relationships and partnerships. Like this is what retailers care about. This is what restaurant owners care about. Like, of course, they care about the quality of the wine. But to me, that's like the table stakes. Like, of course, we're only going to serve great wine. But this is what really makes us different. And this also amplifies our relationships, because anytime we launch something, you know, Sam's going to tweet about it or do an Instagram thing, and Julie, and dress, dress for success, et cetera. So it really helps to, it's like one plus one equals three, is how I think about it.
So um, 89% of our investors are women. Um, that was of our individual investors who invested before the Series A. Um, so many women. So it's a combination of, I spoke about this a little bit yesterday, but I can get a little more detailed about this. So X Factor and TBD, um, if you're at the si size where you're raising for like a million dollars, um, there are a bunch of what are called angel investor networks, and you can just Google them and put them in your spreadsheet. And um, you can, the best way to pitch them is to find the LPs. Those are the limited partners. Those are the people who put money into them or actual partners. Um, and just find somebody on their website who looks like they might be interested in what you're doing and send them a cold email and then keep following up. See if you know anybody on LinkedIn who's connected to you, et cetera. Just like work those networks. And that's how I connected with both X Factor and TBD. So X Factor focuses on female founders with billion dollar ideas. And they always say, you know it when you see it. So they do very, very little diligence. I took two calls with them, each probably half an hour or an hour. And the check that they wrote was 150K. They only write 150K checks and they don't follow on, meaning they don't add additional capital. Um, but if you get a partner there who loves you, like they're a great resource. There are hundreds of these. We pitched hundreds of them, we got one. Um, so that's how you have to do it. And then TBD Angels, um, similarly, this was an angel group that um, doesn't really have a thesis, doesn't really have a focus, but they, we just found a partner who liked us. So again, like hundreds of pitches, two that came in. And then um, all of these other women, so like Tiffany Amber Thiessen, if you're a Saved by the Bell fan, um, or Ruth Reichel, former editor-in-chief of Gourmet, somebody who I've had in my network for 20 years, who I just like keep following up with. She's been a big supporter. Dana Cowan, former editor-in-chief of Food and Wine. Again, somebody in my network from like 20 years, just keeping that relationship alive. Um, and then other, just other cool women who I've like had in my network. Some of them have put in as little as $5,000, some of them as much as hundreds of thousands of dollars. Jen, we're going to have to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, well, we'll wrap. Can I say this one last thing? Yes. OK, last thing. So we have a program called the Hall of Femme, where we um, honor 365 women who have shattered glass ceilings. And we featured them all last year by sending them crates of sparkling wine with a sheet of stunt glass on top. And then when they received it, they shattered the glass ceiling. So, um, so more to come on that. OK, thank you. Thank you.